In mid-2013, the Polynesian Voyaging Society and the voyaging canoe Hokulea will embark on a journey around the world. A 46,000-mile, 36-month voyage to 21 countries with 65 currently planned landfalls. We sail for peace, for the love of our planet, and with the desire to leave the children of the world a hopeful, healthy future. To understand Hokulea is to go back in time to the origin of Polynesia itself. It goes back 7,000 years ago where the first really oceanic people came out of China and came out of Taiwan. Thousands of years after that, spreading through the Pacific Islands in Melanesia, even in Indonesia. Then you get to Polynesia, this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the southwest and Rapa Nui in the east. 10 million square miles, 600 times more water than this land, biggest country on earth, bigger than Russia. And it was discovered by these extraordinary people. And I say extraordinary because you could argue that they were really the astronauts of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the Earth. Today, as we struggle with the depletion of natural resources, the degradation of our land, heavens and oceans, and conflicts that result from overconsumption, we believe that ancient wisdom can and will inspire contemporary solutions. Since her launching in 1975, Hukulea has sailed 135,000 nautical miles throughout Polynesia to Micronesia, Japan, and the west coast of the continental United States. What began as an effort to disprove critics who doubted Polynesians' ability to sail purposefully, unaided by navigational instruments, has grown into a cultural reawakening a living commitment to sustainability, and a movement to bring experiential, value-based, community-grounded education to the forefront. As the Hawaiian culture is re-emerging, rediscovering, re-strengthening, that's not a common story around the world. That is a story that is unique. There are cultures and languages that have been lost every single day across this planet. This voyage intensely is supposed to honor it's supposed to celebrate and it's supposed to strengthen all cultures on the planet by respecting them. Lehua Kamalu is one of the Polynesian Voyaging Society's emerging young navigators. We wouldn't be here today if our ancestors didn't figure out how to live in balance with their environment and with these islands. There is a lesson in going back to traditional practices and finding some way of bridging the gap between what is modern and ancient and making life livable and healthy and safe. Ka'iu Lani Murphy has been sailing on Hokulea since 1997 and is one of very few crew members who will sail the entire worldwide voyage. This is a critical time for us. A lot of people are realizing that because of things that we've done to the planet, to our oceans, the land in the past, that just affects our ability to have oxygen to breathe. And so it's not limited to somebody in Hawaii. It affects everybody that breathes. Along with building better relationships with people around the world who have the same desire to take care of our planet, you know, we're part of a movement to have leaders, peace leaders, really, with the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, to recognize that there is something special about Hokulea, special to us, and I think it does bring that kind of worldwide attention that we are on the right path and we are something that can carry that message of peace around the world. Investment is not an investment for a monetary reward at the end. You're not going to cash in on this and say, all right, now I have this much money. It's an investment in the earth. It's an investment in the future. It's an investment in keeping 
traditions and resources and knowledge and learning alive for the future generations. If you come from the lens of what the canoe is supposed to do, it will do nothing if we're tied to the dock. We're not going to change the world, but we're going to go and build a network with, of people around the earth who are going to change it. And our job is to help them be successful. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you, you're very kind and very generous. Uh, commercials first. This weekend, we are, we're hosting our Imiloa uh, Wayfinding and uh, Navigation Festival at, on the grounds of the Imiloa Astronomy Center. So I'm inviting all of you personally. <laughs> uh, it's from 10 to 4. Uh, it starts off with a planetarium show. Then we have Makahiki Games. Uh, at 1 o'clock, we have a, a document, uh, documentary by Sam Lowe called The Navigators. And then at 2 o'clock, we have a very interesting uh, panel of select voyagers called Temana o Temuana, the spirit of the sea, which was a fleet of seven canoes that sailed from uh, New Zealand uh, through the South Pacific and up to Hawaii, then down the coast of uh, 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 California and back across the Pacific, and it ended up in uh, the Solomon Islands. So uh, uh, I've invited uh, six voyagers to come and share uh, their experiences. So, Hilani Koluna Henua Kulalo, and I, you know, I am not a speaker. I'm a storyteller, and I just prefer to have this relationship with my audience as one-on-one. -on -one. So, Hilani Kuluna Henua Kolalo, it means the heavens above and the earth below. And I found this proverb to kind of help to share this story, a powerful story about uh, how the Pacific came to be settled and uh, the efforts of modern-day voyagers to relearn this art and about their mission. Uh, preserving this art. So, uh, and I understand that uh, the Keck Observatory does tremendous work. And um, what really is the connection between observers up on Mauna Kea and, and oceanic voyagers? And quite frankly, the one connection and the only connection that I can see is this great love and appreciation for those tiny beacons of light that are light years away. And if we can just come and have this, this really comforting conversation about exploration, about explorers on the mountain, um, exploring the universe to seek out answers, uh, very profound answers for our future, and about Oceanians exploring the oceans and coming to settle and call these islands home. Well, the story begins for us some uh, uh, 200 years ago, uh, well, excuse me, some 1,200 years ago, when the first voyaging canoe happened upon these islands. Um, about 200 years ago, uh, Captain Cook happened upon these islands, and he wrote in his logbook, these natives speak the, the familiar language of Otahiri. How could an island separated by so much uh, leagues of open ocean come to have been settled by a common people? And so it began this debate this great debate about the settlement of the Pacific. Now, there were basically two movements of people into the Pacific. Okay? Early Homo sapiens who walked in the Pacific, there was a peninsula of land called Sahu, which was the Australian um, subcontinent, and then there was a, a, a Southeast Asian peninsula called Sunda. Okay. So, basically, this happened in the last Pleistocene era, era when uh, the sea levels were significantly lower, uh, so the uh, waterways were basically walkable. And these people walked into the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, There was probably one waterway that separated these islands, but it was only 40 nautical miles wide. So you could basically hang on to a log, and it would take you about two days to drift across. So these people, 50,000 years ago, walked into the Pacific. And then some about 10,000 years ago, Go, the Holocene period uh, set in, the sea levels rose, and now these people who walked into the Pacific are permanently landlocked. 
they got as far east as these islands here uh, in uh, 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 Western Oceania, but that's as far as they got because they could only walk, and primarily because they didn't uh, they didn't possess any kind of seafaring technology. Then about 5,000 years ago, and I know it says about 7,000 years ago, it, it could have been 7,000 years ago, a second wave of, uh, of people migrate into the Pacific. Okay? They carry with them this dentate stamp type pottery for carrying their food product in. Uh, they speak the Austronesian language. They are coastal farmers and they are traders. Okay? But the one thing they possess that the previous culture of some 50,000 years ago didn't possess was they possess canoe technology. They possessed the ability to sail into the face of the prevailing trade winds. Okay, so about 5,000 years ago, they end up here in the, uh, uh, in, in the western uh, uh, Oceania. Uh, and these islands are closely, closely um, um, they're, they're, they're relatively close to each other. So, while they're developing this, their seafaring skills, they're sailing in between these islands, and they're getting ready for further expansion east into islands that are spread out more and more. Then about 3,000 years ago, they end up in Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and the Tokelau Islands. And this becomes the gateway into Polynesia. All the characteristic traits that we distinguish as, as distinctly Polynesian is developed here in Western Polynesia, in the Samoan Islands, the Tongan Islands, and the Tokelau Islands. In fact, the word Tokelau is a, uh, uh, Ko'olau is a derivative of the word uh, Tokelau, which is to the north and east of, uh, of the Samoan Islands. And Tonga is the same word as Kona, yeah? which is to the leeward side of the islands. So these are very, very old terms. Then about maybe 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, they pushed east. Yeah, into the widespread islands of, of, of central Polynesia and they settled on Cook Islands and Tahiti and then the last fringes of, of uh, landfall that they make is Hawaii in the north about 1200 years ago uh, Rapa Nui in the east about a thousand years ago and only 800 years ago did they arrive in New Zealand okay. but the range the range that these islanders had was vast these Austronesian language speaking people migrated as far east as the coast of South America and as far west as Madagascar off the coast of uh, Eastern Africa. In fact, in fact, Madagascar wasn't settled by anyone from Africa. It was settled by Austronesian language speaking people that came all the way from these islands here, uh, island Taiwan. Okay. But the real question is, is how did these islanders well, why did they migrate east? Because the prevailing trade winds blow from east to west. Yeah? We understand that the winds go into wind reversals. Just like we get corner winds here, they have, we have corner winds in, in the South Pacific where the winds would blow from west to east. Okay? So they could have gotten on these westerly winds, sailed as far east as possible, and if the winds came back to blow from east to west, they just turn around and go back home. Okay? Then, uh, in... Uh, El Nino cycle years, the winds blow from the west to east direction, uh, pre prevailingly longer seasons. So that's an, another reason. But one practice that we had culturally um, uh, was uh, called primogeniture. That is the eldest sibling inherited all wealth. So if you were a younger sibling, right, wanting to inherit land, you had to go out and discover it on your own. Um, yeah, but think about it, right? These, these islanders in Taiwan, from Taiwan, they come through these islands and they find these islands already settled. And they work their way east and they finally come to an island that's not settled. And a light bulb goes off in their head. And that idea is that if they keep on sailing in the face of the prevailing trade winds, they're going to find more and more islands that are not settled. Yeah? These are going to be all undiscovered islands because it lays off wind. Okay. Well, our mythology tells us of this great uh, fleets of migration and it's very very romantic but what real what kind of solid concrete evidence is there to uh, to demonstrate that um, Oceania was settled by a common people 
besides language, linguistics is, is, is a very strong uh, 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 piece of evidence. Uh, we have DNA, but truly the, the kind of evidence that we are searching for that, that could lead to a lot of the answers is in archaeology. This is Napuka Atoll. Yeah? It is part of the Tuamotu, uh, Tuamotu Archipelago, which is a chain of islands about 240 miles north of Tahiti. Okay. About 15 years ago, two researchers from the University of Hawaii proposed a study where they would study 18 stone adzes that was collected by Dr. Emery in the 1930s. Now, uh, they wanted to study these adzes because these are all coral atolls and stone adzes come from basalt. So if they could find out where the stone adzes came from, yeah, they could figure out its dispersal pattern. Okay, so... Um, they employ a, 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 a system called uh, plasma mass spectrometry where they can actually take this a chemical and mineralogical signature of a piece of stone and they can take it back to the eruptive phase that it came from, or the eruptive place. So if it had a sample from someplace like Haleakala, it could definitely identify that it came from the Haleakala uh, site. So, they had this one small nondescript as, which was C7727. And what they found was that that stone, which ended up here in Napuka Atoll, had as its roots the island of Koolave, a lava flow there. Actually, a lava flow in particular off the uh, uh, western side of the island. This is called, uh, this point of land here is called Kiali Kahiki, uh, which means the road to foreign lands. Yeah? So that piece of evidence was um, significant in establishing that there was contact between uh, 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 these oceanic peoples. They probably took the stone, didn't make the ads here in Hawaii, took the stone, made the ads in the uh, South Pacific, and, uh, and then transported it from some island like Tahiti up to Napuka. Uh, okay, but despite the, uh, and this evidence was, was uh, of course, most recently, but in the 1950s, there was much debate about, uh, about the settlement of, of Oceania. Um, two people in particular, one was Andrew Sharp, a uh, uh, New Zealand civil servant, wrote a book called uh, Voyages in, 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 in the Pacific, and basically he claimed that, that uh, Pacific Islands were settled by accident. He gave credit for voyages up to 300 nautical miles, but anything greater than that, it was impossible for him to imagine that uh, oceanic people could have settled these islands, quite frankly, because uh, they didn't have Western technology, they didn't have the use of a compass or a sextant, and they were basically, uh, they didn't have a written language, they didn't have the sophistication. Um, uh, on top of that, they, they sailed canoes that was hollowed out of wood, and they tied their canoes together with plant fiber, and then they plated leaves together to make sails. How can these people actually settle? So, and then there was another person, right? This, guy here who built Kontiki, yeah? uh, Thor Heyerdahl. Now, Thor Heyerdahl based his argument on the fact that the winds, prevailing winds, blow from east to west. And so he built a balsa wood raft. Okay, so this is what Thor Heyerdahl proved. If he, built a balsa, if he built a balsa wood raft, then he got that wrong because, quite frankly, Polynesians sell canoes and not rafts. And if you towed a canoe, uh, towed a raft, a hundred miles offshore, which he did, he told the canoe, hundred miles offshore, told the raft, a hundred miles offshore, it's gonna take you a hundred days to drift to land. And that's what it took him. Okay, and that's all he proved. Okay. <laughs> However, the debate was raging about how these, um, how, how the Pacific could have possibly settled. And so, onto the stage stepped uh, Herb, Herb, Herb Connie, uh, artist Herb Connie, Ben Finney and Tommy Holmes, and together they formed the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And what they proposed is a, 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 an experiment in archaeology. It was a total, uh, it was, a, a, it was a, 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 a project grounded in science, right? Where thereby they were going to recreate this artifact, a voyaging canoe. This is a design accurate replica of a voyaging canoe, not a construction accurate replica. And then they're going to sail it on a, a, a voyage from Hawaii to Tahiti and, and Tahiti back to Hawaii, and they're gonna employ a system of non-instrument navigation. For this uh, experiment, uh, they recruited Mao Piailag 
from the tiny island of Sarawak, who was uh, uh, one of our, my teachers. So let me just tell you a story about Mao. When they went, they, um, they, they really wanted a Polynesian navigator. So they went and re recruited in the Santa Cruz Islands. The Santa Cruz Islands is, a, is an outlier of, of Polynesia. They found an uh, islander they named Tevaki. But uh, Tevaki told him that he would send word to the um, society uh, about whether or not he'd, he'd, he'd want to navigate the canoe. And he, the, uh, the society, the Polynesian Voyaging Society, did receive word. It was, uh, came in the form of a letter from his family and said that Tevaki had grown old and tired and that he had called all the family into the canoe house and said goodbye and he had paddled out on the sea, was never to be seen again. So with the demise of Tevaki, um, all hopes of recruiting a uh, uh, um, Polynesian navigator ended. But then we found this, this, this gentleman here in, uh, in uh, uh, the Caroline Islands. They still practice the art of uh, non-instrument navigation and in particular Sarawak uh, still has a, a, a voyaging families. And Sarawak is a small island, maybe two miles by half mile, two miles long, half mile wide. And the reef is, is like from here to where the projector is. So there's not enough fish within the reef to feed the islanders. So Mao, who is one of uh, uh, seven canoe families, he belongs to one, one of seven canoe families, uh, his job is to actually take islanders out to go voyage or to go fish the, the shoals that are beyond where the Sarawak dips uh, below the horizon. And he goes to neighboring islands where you cannot see Sarawak. But he goes and fishes and he gathers up the, 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 the fish and, and, and the bird eggs and, and, and the sea turtles. And he brings them back to his island and then he distributes. It, it, they call him the, the master divider. Anyway, we went around the island and Mao was the lowest of all the uh, navigators. And he was the only person that was willing to come to Hawaii to, to, to help um, teach. But, you know, I've got to share something. that The fact that Mao came to Hawaii to share his knowledge was grounded in the idea that a lot of the islanders, the young men, were, were departing this, uh, his island, and he didn't see. He felt that if he couldn't export the knowledge, then, uh, then he would be the last navigator on his island. So he broke with tradition, and it, it kind of ostracized him in the society that he had exported this knowledge. So, so for many years, uh, Mao kind of, he lived at the end of the island. He was the last house, and he lived by himself. He's kind of a recluse. Anyway. So, Mao agreed, he came to Hawaii in 1976, and in 1976, they sailed Hokulea successfully from uh, Hawaii to Tahiti, yeah? And so they fulfilled the mission of the voyage, yeah? Uh, and they were greeted by, oh God, 27,000 people, it was a national holiday. But it was a failure. It was a social failure. Because, quite frankly, tensions got so bad on the canoe that it came to fisticuffs. Yeah? And, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't part of the voyage, and, and I'm pretty diplomatic. I put the blame on, on both sides of the, the, the canoe. See, there was, there was the, the Western scientific side of the crew members, and then there was the Hawaiians. And there was a, a group of guys in the middle. And quite frankly, I don't think anyone explained to the Hawaiians what the mission was. Yeah. And the Hawaiians should have asked. But I also ask is, did you guys ever interview the crew members trying out for the trip? They never had a conversation. They never sat down. I mean, just have leadership sit down with one, one crew member at a time and ask them, what, what do you think this trip is about? and begin to build a conversation, but they never, they never had that conversation, so it broke down. And Mao was just disgusted with the whole, uh, with the whole uh, canoe uh, uh, project that he just wrote a scathing letter. In fact, when he got to Tahiti, he had uh, his, his uh, uh, niece and his uh, niece's husband uh, uh, waiting for him ashore, and he went, left the crew, and he went with the, the, uh, the niece and, and, uh, and the niece's husband, and. Uh, they flew him out to, uh, uh, I think, to Fiji and then back home. Yeah, to Fiji and then back home to Hawaii. But Mao wrote a scathing letter, and he basically said, uh, 
The crew that sailed from Hawaii to Tahiti, no good. I think the crew that sailed from Tahiti back to Hawaii may be no good too. So I leave you now. Don't come find me in my islands. You can never find me. And he just left and he departed the project. So that left a big hole in the project. And um, uh, um, so Hokulea sailed back to Hawaii in 1976 under um, uh, uh, Western navigation rules. Yeah, so they used instruments. Uh, on board the canoe was Nainoa Thompson. So Nainoa Thompson was hoping to learn from Mao, but he lost his opportunity. But, but Nainoa was very, very uh, ingenious. And so he started to re-engineer the art of navigation. And the way he did that was through academics. He went back to the university. And he studied, he asked questions as to how could this system be re-engineered? What kinds of things would you need to know? So one of the, 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 the greatest things was uh, meteorology, right? The, the study of weather. Now, Nainoa is no fool. He doesn't go to classes. He just signs up for directed research. And he signs up for directed research with the heads of the department. So he goes to the top of the pie and he, and he gets to quick answers, and he starts to re-engineer the system of navigation. And then in 1978, uh, we propose a trip to sail back to Tahiti again, and I know I was going to be the navigator. And I'm, uh, I'm recruited, and I step into this room, uh, and I notice right away, I'm from the neighbor islands, I'm from Maui, and uh, that there's a, they got all these, they got all these um, top-notch watermen, and there's this one person in the room that just want this big surf meet. So I kind of shyly, as soon as the meeting gets over, I walk to the elevator, I get in the elevator, and as the, um, the elevator door is closed, this gentleman steps into the elevator, and he turns around to me, and he says in his real pidgin English, hey, brother, we're going to be trying out for this thing together. More better we start out by being friends. I still remember him saying, more better we start out by being friends. My name is Eddie Aikau. And Eddie Aikau, oh, Eddie was the, uh, he was at the top of his game, big wave riders. He, you know, talked to me about surfing 30-foot waves and what it took to, uh, to withstand uh, uh, the pressure of being underneath the water for so long. Uh, he was a health nut. He really watched his weight. And, you know, as much as drugs was, 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 was a part of the North Shore scene, he never did any drugs. And quite frankly, that was because of his dedication. That was his dedication to his passion, which is surfing. Every Sunday, no matter how big the surf was, he would always take his parents to church. He would always take his parents to church. He drove this old beat-up VW bug, but he didn't let anybody smoke in it. And he kept all his surfboards from the time he was a child in the rafters of his, of his house. So it was just lined with... with uh, and he told me he had a problem. If uh, he was to take his surfboards to Tahiti, that the teaser would ask it for him and he'd be forced to give it to him. So he didn't take a surfboard. Eddie Aikau was one of the two first lifeguards uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the north shore of Wau, and Eddie had a scanner, and the Haleiwa uh, uh, Fire Department would say whenever they got a call for a rescue, whenever they got to the beach, uh, Eddie would already be out in the water uh, rescuing people. Eddie pulled 360 people out of, the, uh, out of the water a year. Yeah, That's almost one person every day. Okay, so... And uh, I didn't make the crew. I was an alternate. But March 16, 1978 was the day that they had departed. And it was a, a zoo down there with a lot of media coverage. And um, to just realize that it was a frenzy. And that in the afternoon, they started to load gear on. And they loaded a lot of gear on the stern. And they left pretty late in the evening. So they, they didn't have... They didn't take the time to go and reorganize the gear, so the stern was real, real low in the water. And um, what happened was that um, about four hours into the trip, and they didn't have an escort boat, um, uh, one of the hatch covers in the very back of the canoe, which, which seals, the, to the, uh, uh, seals the, the, the floor, came loose, and water got into the compartment. And if you know what happens, once water gets into the compartment, if you don't address that problem right now, it's going to just get progressively worse and it's going to accelerate. And within a matter of 30 minutes, uh, the canoe was, was flipped over. And um, uh, they were, uh, uh, the crew uh, was in the water for oh, uh, 20, 22 hours uh, before they were uh, sighted. But the last flight of Hawaiian Airlines between Kona and uh, 
Oahu. And the pilot said, if you sit in the cockpit of the plane, and, and he, for some reason, he, he didn't get word that he could leave, so, that, so what that did was force him to vector further south. And because he vectored further south, he was able to see the canoe. Because he said the windows on the airplane is like this, yeah? So if he had flown the original course, he would have flown right over the canoe. But because he was rerouted further south, he was able to see the flares. And he said it was lucky because they had already flo uh, uh, drifted into the, f the flight lanes for planes that fly between Hawaii and Tahiti, and they only fly once a week. So they was rescued by the skin of their teeth. But sometime in the morning, Eddie Aikau asked to go for help. Now, I'm not going to debate uh, the merits of, of, of his request because... These guys was in, in dire uh, situation, but uh, Eddie told me, and he said that in case there's any kind of uh, uh, emergency, that he would be the one. And he didn't say what. He just said, you know that I'm going to be the one. And so he shared that with me. Well, we, we searched for Eddie for a number of days, and then um, guys were starting to get hurt. Somebody broke his leg in the search, so the family called the search off. Uh, um, so it was very tragic. But it's important for us guys to share that, that uh, the way in which Eddie lived, yeah? Uh, because it's an important part of the story. So now, 1976, the guys are fighting on a canoe. 1978, the canoe flips over. We kill one of our dear sailors. Uh, so everybody was calling for the end of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. You know, you already proved in 1976 that you, you could sail. There's no need to do it anymore. But quite frankly, what emerged was uh, a group of young Hawaiians. A group of young Hawaiians got together and said, we, we want to we wanna resurrect the canoe. We want to, Eddie had this vision of pulling the islands out of the sea. We wanted to, we wanted to have that vision realized. And uh, so um, the society immediately reorganized. And then this person stepped onto the scene. His name is Pinky Thompson. Yeah? Pinky Thompson is the father of Nainoa Thompson. He's a bishop estate trustee. He's a corporate manager. So he's very two business kind of a person. And he told I know, okay, if you wanna do this thing right, then you get your friends together and let's go talk about how we're gonna rebuild the organization. So we did. I know recruited a bunch of us and we started to rebuild the canoe. We started to uh, outfit the canoe with all the necessary safety equipment and then we started to train rigorously and then we got an escort boat, yeah. Uh, but Piggy Thompson is a real interesting story. He, in, during the uh, World War II, when the war broke out, he, he was young and he tried to uh, join the army, but he, they, they couldn't because of his age. So he went to the west coast of, of uh, America and he, and he got in. He got in as a Native American. And um, so he got in as a Native American, and what did they make Native uh, uh, Americans become? They become the point people, right, for his platoon. So on D-Day, he's, he's uh, uh, weaving his way back behind enemy lines and he gets shot through his eye and he's blinded, and uh, he's, uh, they drag him back, and they, they throw him on a pile of wounded that is for the untreatable, and his friends say no. So they're going to drag him, and they're going to take him back to the shore, and in that process, one of the, um, one of the soldiers that are dragging Pinky back to the shore uh, dies, uh, but Pinky says that uh, for the year that he was in, in darkness, that he, he was... It really galvanized his, his clarity of thought and that his, um, he understood that his life mission would be in service to his people. So it was under Pinky Thompson's leadership that we start to rebuild ourselves. Okay. And then, so Nainoa is, 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 uh, is rebuilding the organization. Um, and then he has this, uh, he has this uh, uh, issue with... Uh, he, he, okay, the full moon sets opposite the sun, right? But it sets at a diagonal, okay? Now, I know I thought that the sun would be full but would set at a parallel. So, if, if the, uh, uh, the sun was setting at, at 10 degrees south, he thought that the moon would be at 10 degrees south. He didn't realize it would be at 10 degrees north. So, he had this big problem. He went to the university. The university sent him to, this, to the planetarium at the Bishop Museum and said, go see this guy, Will Kasaka. So Will Kasalka is this incredible teacher, and he never ever answers a question by giving you an answer. He always tells you, let's go explore the reason why. <laughs> and I, sometimes I just get frustrated, just tell me the answer. <laughs> but let's go explore the reason why. But it was 
really this conversation between Nainoa and Will that started to, to kind of fuse this, this, this culture and, and science dynamic. And this was the roots of it, culture and science. And Will Kaselka became Nainoa's mentor. And Nainoa, uh, Nainoa had such a vast understanding of astronomy that he far outpaced what Mao knew. Yeah? Mao, Mao didn't even come close to what Nainoa knew astronomically. Uh, just Nainoa had the great advantage of academics. But what Nainoa didn't possess was the discipline, the discipline of an oceanic navigator. And he knew that was missing. So he talked to his father about the problem. And the father said, you know what you got to do? You got to go back and get your teacher. Yeah. So Nainoa got on a plane and went to Saipan and found Mao Piailog on the beach. And he apologized for the behavior of the crew. And he begged Mao to come back to Hawaii to help round out his, 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 uh, his teaching. Yeah. And so Mao agreed in 1979. Came back to Hawaii and started training uh, Nainoa. Nainoa was in particularly most interested in is how do you stay up at night? for these prolonged periods of time. And um, I don't think Mao had an answer except that to say that you have to live in the element. You have to be in the zone. Anyway, so uh, in 1980, we navigate Hokulea back to Tahiti and I make the crew and I'm on board the crew from Hawaii to Tahiti and I get so interested in the navigation that Nainoa realizes that he has to start teaching somebody. So he asked me if I'd stay on board the canoe and sail back from Tahiti to Hawaii, and I agreed, and I kind of regret agreeing to it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so how does navigation work? We, okay, yeah, all right. So uh, how does navigation work? Okay, the, uh, the whole process of navigation is grounded to the star compass, yeah? And it's a, it's a sidereal compass, meaning that um, it's based upon stars. Yeah, it's based upon the rising and setting points of stars. Um, now, I've been studying sidereal star compasses, and there's this interesting phenomena that I've been finding out, and it's that people in the Western Pacific, yeah, like Micronesia, people in Indonesia, and sailors in Saudi Arabia all use the same stars for their star compass. They all use altar rising and altar setting for east. Even though altar doesn't rise due east, it rises 10 degrees north of east, but they all use the same stars. So I'm kind of on this uh, 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 research gig, or just trying to find out if it was a diffuse system or if they uh, developed it um, uh, non-collaboratively, yeah? if they just developed it on their own, I think it was a diffuse system. Because why would they share all the same stars in this star compass? OK, so navigation works this way. You only know where you are by memorizing each and every second where you're going. So let me do a demonstration. Okay, so where, where was I? Do you guys never see? I was, how many steps did I take? Five. So where am I? Five steps from where I started from, right? You only know where you are by memorizing each and every second where you've gone. Because if you break that process of memorizing or knowing where you've gone, then you're lost. And there ain't nothing in nature that's going to get you back on track. Once you're lost, you're lost. So you got to always have an idea where you're at. Even if it's a guess, you got you to gotta think you know where you're at. Yeah, you got to think you know where you're at. So this is our celestial star compass. This is the Hawaiian star compass, but it's based on the same tradition as, as uh, Mao. Okay, we have, okay, so you stand in a circle, in the middle of the circle, and the edge of the circle is the horizon. We only have two horizons, yeah? 
Horizon in the east, the arriving horizon, which is hikina, yeah? Hikina means to arrive. Okay? And the entering horizon. Enter means, uh, komohana means to enter. So, arriving, and all celestial bodies arrive east, migrate across the sky, and then re-enter the horizon in the west. Okay? If I stand in the middle of the circle, and I face west of komohana, with hikina to my back, my right shoulder is called akao, my left shoulder is called hema. Yeah, a cow is right, hema is left, a cow is also north, and hema is south. So stars arrive east, climb halfway up in the sky, and then cross this line between a cow and hema, and then it starts to descend in the west. Okay? Each one of these names is called a house. We have 32 houses on our compass, I'm not going to test you guys. But Hikina, Komohana, Akao, and Hema are the only four names that are different. Okay? We have La on either side of East, Aina, Noyo, Manu, Nalani, Naleo, and Haka. So if a star was to arrive on our eastern horizon, in the star house we call Aina, in the southern part of the compass, yeah, it's going to climb across the sky, and it's going to crest, on this Akao Hema line, then it's going to descend and it's going to re enter the same place on the opposite side of the horizon. So if it arrives in Aina, you know it's going to re enter in Aina. Yeah? If it arrives here in Manu, it's going to re enter in Manu. So the compass mirrors itself from east to west. Okay? It also mirrors itself diagonally yeah? from northeast to southwest, from northwest to southeast. So, this is how we employ the, uh, the celestial star field, yeah? the sun, the daytime star, the sun, the moon, the planets, uh, and the stars. Okay? But the other component that we have to integrate into the compass is the oceanic sea swells and the wind. And they move diagonally through the compass. So if the wind, and the wind, notice in the wind in the tropics, right, which is Hawaii in the north, 23 and a half degrees north and through 23 and a half degrees south, blow from east to west. Yeah? They all blow from Hikina to Komohana, the same direction as a star field. So if the wind was to enter the compass we call, in a house we call Manu in the northeast, yeah? northeast Kolau, it's going to move diagonally through the compass, it's going to move through you and the canoe, and it's going to exit the same house on the opposite side, Manu. Yeah? If it enters the house we call Aina, it's going to enter the house we call Aina, and it's going to exit the house we call Aina. And this is a tr traditional system for, for, of orientation and, and organization. It helps take that very dynamic environment and bring order to it. Yeah? Yeah? And this process or this, this framework for, for teaching orientation has been taught for thousands of years. Thousands of years. So, on a sail from Hawaii to Tahiti, yeah? Hawaii is in the north, Tahiti is in the south, this is east, this is west, the star field is all going to move from east to west, yeah? And the wind is going to blow from east to west. So you're going to sail to Tahiti, and you're going to keep the star field on your port side, on the left side of the canoe, yeah? And you're going to sail underneath the star field. You're going to keep the wind and the waves moving from, from the port side through the starboard side of the canoe. And you're going to sail as close as possible to the wind, because Tahiti is a little bit upwind of, of Hawaii. But for you sail back to Hawaii from Tahiti, it's basically a northward sail. Yeah? It's a northward sail, and then you need to read latitude, and then at the right latitude, you need to turn your canoe downwind and go and search for land. So this is the part where we have a little bit of fun. Uh, we use our hands to estimate latitude. Now, longitude, east or west on the planet, you cannot tell that unless you have a chronometer. But you can tell latitude very accurately by measuring the altitude of certain stars as it reaches meridian. Yeah, when it's on that Akao Hema line, it's the highest part of the, um, its track. You can measure the altitude of that star down to the horizon like uh, Polaris. Polaris is one hand span above the horizon. But one hand span above the horizon is a little navigational trick. It's too big of a 
distance to measure. Why don't, you want to measure stuff that is low. You want to turn your hand sideways. So when you're in the northern hemisphere, you turn yourself around and you measure stuff in the southern hemisphere. When you're in the southern hemisphere, you turn yourself around and you measure stuff in the north, northern hemisphere, stuff that is low to the horizon. So, so this is a, a, a calibration picture of Nainoa calibrating his hand. And this is what is, we we're really interested in, is this six degree mark, three fingers above the horizon. Well, two and a half, yeah? Two and a half fingers above the horizon. Uh, because this is uh, Polaris, one hand span above the horizon. But in particular, what we want to measure is the Southern Cross in the south for the latitude of Hawaii. Okay. When you, when you start up from Tahiti, Southern Cross is way up here in the night sky, and you watch it cross over the sky. But every night it gets lower and lower and lower. And when the Southern Cross finally reaches an altitude where the top star and the bottom star is equal to the horizon, yeah, this is called equidistant pairs, you're at the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. In fact, you're at the latitude of the direct center of the Hawaiian Islands, which is in the channel between Maui and the Big Island. Okay? So, yeah. So, A Crocs and Gay Crocs, that's the top star and bottom star in the Southern Cross, equal to the horizon. Okay, so this is the Southern Cross rising. It's getting higher. Now it's upright. So, now you're going to measure it, yeah? Equal, equally distant to the horizon means you're at the latitude of the islands. So, now, at the latitude of the islands, our strategy is always, uh, it's, it's called upwind sailing. So, in other words, you want to be upwind of your target. So, the winds blow from east to west. So, you want to be east of the islands. Right? We have never been west of the islands. I think you got to be a pretty bad navigator to be west of the islands. Uh, because it's, it's pretty, it's like uh, 400, maybe 600, no, 400, 400 miles uh, that, that uh, Tahiti's east of uh, Hawaii. So to sail that far west, it's gonna, you're going to have to sail downwind a couple days, blindly, stupidly. <laughs> so, okay, at that point, at that point, at that point, um, uh, you're going to turn your canoe downwind, you're going to put your, your, your uh, okole here in Hikina and you point your bow, Kumohana. But let me, you know, I, I missed a step here. Our navigation, you know what, the way that I was taught, I was taught real metaphorically. Uh, and as highly technical as, as navigation is, is, it's really taught with a lot of metaphor. So I was having a lot of issues learning this, this, this compass. And I know I just said, okay, come here, I want to show you something. And he's never done this lesson. I've always asked the other students, he's never done this lesson for other students. So I'm going to show you guys this lesson right now. He took a bird and he cut it out, out of paper. And then he took a canoe and he cut the canoe out of paper. And he put the bird on, on a table. And he said, the bird flies in the oceanic environment. Right? And the bird always has a relationship with the horizon. Okay, so... So what do you mean by that? Think about it. If the head of the bird points towards one edge of the horizon, where does the tail point? The opposite direction, right? If the right wing points towards one edge of the horizon, where does the left wing point? In the opposite direction. So the bird always has a relationship with the horizon. Yeah? The bird doesn't need to see where he's going. He can cover up his eyes if he knows what's supposed to be behind him. Or if he knows what's supposed to be on the right side of the bird, or if the bird knows, he's supposed to know what's on the left side of the bird. Just by figuring out that one bearing point, he can figure out direction. And that was an aha moment. But the even bigger aha moment was when he took the canoe. And he put the canoe and the bird together. And he said, the bird is the canoe. The bird is the canoe. Yeah. If the bow of the canoe or if the head of the bird is pointing in one direction, then the stern of the canoe or the tail of the bird is pointing in the opposite direction. If the starboard side of the canoe is pointing towards one edge of the horizon, then the port side of the canoe, the left wing, is pointing towards the other side of the horizon. So the bird and the canoe is the same thing. Smart, huh? Okay. So, 
you're someplace east of the Hawaiian Islands, right? You got to turn your canoe downwind, okay? We all agree that we're east of the Hawaiian Islands, right? The navigator says that we're east of the Hawaiian Islands. So we're going to trust him and we're going to turn our canoe downwind, okay? We're going to put our stern here in Hikina and we're going to put our bow someplace over here in Komohana. These two houses called Aina, what does Aina mean? Man, okay. So as long as I keep my bow between the house Aina in the north and the house Aina in the south, I'm going to arrive at land. Okay? So, if the head of the bird is pointing towards Aina, where's the tail of the bird pointing towards? Aina. If the head of the bird is pointing towards Aina in the northwest, where's the tail pointing towards? In the southeast. Aina. So, as, as long as you keep your bow and your stern between the two houses we call Aina, okay, the system works. And this is a tropic-centric system. Yeah? In other words, it works best in the tropics. Now, for navigating up around Alaska or around South Africa, that's another story. That's, uh, it's got problems, but there's, there's ways of navigating around, around those, uh, those, those situations. Uh, so, you turn your bow downwind, and if you're lucky, and if you've done your homework, you're going to end up being blown to, towards land. Uh, I work at Imilo Astronomy Center of Hawaii. I am the navigator in residence there. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I host um, navigation workshops. I work with uh, our partner museums about incorporating indigenous voice in their, uh, uh, in their museums. And I'm, I, I perform outreach. I've got two workshops I'm doing on Maui next week. But uh, yeah, the Worldwide Voyage, I'm just going to wrap up here real quick. Uh, it's going to take three years, I believe, for us guys to complete this voyage. Um, Really, the voyage is, is being driven um, by the pole navigators. And let me just talk about the pole navigator. In 2007, um, Mao was the last of the pole navigators. He was, he was inducted sometime after the war. And then because of the uh, religious connotations of it, uh, uh, and Catholicism came to the island, they, they banned the pole. Um, so there was, uh, so they didn't perform the ceremony until uh, 2007. 2007, Mao was on his last legs, and he asked the um, the island chief if he could uh, reinstitute the uh, the order of Po, and the chief agreed. Uh, besides 11 islanders, he invited five Hawaiians, and this is the first time that people from outside of, uh, of the Caroline Islands have been inducted. So there was. Um, Five of us that was initiated into the order of Po, uh, one was Nainoa Thompson, uh, Nainoa's brother-in-law, Bruce Blankenfield, uh, Chad Paishan from Waimea, um, Shorty Burleman from Kauai High, and then uh, myself from Kona. But the worldwide voyage is being driven by the Po navigators as the senior tier of leadership. However, it's an Oahu-centric operation, meaning that uh, it's... it's uh, um, uh, Although we, 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 we advise on the project, we're really not that involved in, in the leadership of the, of the, the project. Um, that's about to change, though, as the, as the project gets into its launching days. Uh, really, two issues uh, with the worldwide voyage. One is weather, yeah, and basically this, hurricanes, yeah. So uh, to avoid the hurricane season, yeah, and, and hurricane season in the tropics always occurs do, during the summer. So you sail in the winter. As long as you're sailing in the winter, you're going to avoid the hurricane season. Okay? So that's the first criteria. And the second criteria is, what do you think all these dots are? Pirates. pirates. Yeah. Yeah, look at the, the incidence of, of pirates, piracy. So to avoid pirates, we're going to sail across the Indian Ocean down to Madagascar and then um, uh, around South Africa and then back up and then across to Brazil. Um, and hopefully we can stay clear of the pirates. <laughs> um, again, this, this project, its mission is about building a network of environmental organizations. Uh, it's about educating our, our families here in Hawaii, but also about educating the world about, about really the detrimental state of the ocean. There was, an art, there was uh, three articles in the newspaper, I believe, last week or the week before, about ocean acidification. It's real, yeah, uh, it's real. Um, and lastly, it's about sharing culture. And you can follow the voyage in hokulea.org. I think I've reached the end of my, my talk. It's 8 o'clock.
Thank <laughs> you.